Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? Figured I'd show you something that I normally don't cover on the channel, but you might be interested in anyway. I decommissioned a few servers. I've got this guy and then a few more over to the other side we'll look at in a little bit. There's something kind of interesting about this server and the other ones that you might be interested in. I don't know, I'm filming this on my lunch break at work. This is an IBM X5 uh, model 3850. It's from probably around 2011, 2012, something like that. Freshly decommissioned. Most servers are like one or two rack you high, so they're about half as high as this guy. But this thing is really, really beefy, and I figured I'd kind of give you a bit of a tour of it, because not too many people get to see this class of hardware, I guess you could say. But let's pop the hood, and I'll show you what makes this thing a little bit different. So you flip up this latch, push it back. This whole lid comes up and you can see there's lots of information on here. This is classic IBM. Um, this system, like I said, from probably 2011, 2012, it was purchased before I started working here, but it's also pre Lenovo buyout. You know, famously uh, Lenovo ended up buying IBM's hardware, you know, computer hardware business off of them. And so this is a true IBM system. I remember having to call in once for support on this years ago, uh, and I was actually talking to IBM, which was an experience in and of itself. The first thing that makes this box kind of interesting is this setup. So you unlatch this guy, and again, trying to do this one-handed, flip it up, and there we go. And then you pull this daughter card out, and you can see there's some RAM on there. There are eight RAM slots, DDR3 ECC, so this is server grade memory that they're correcting. Each of these sticks is 16 gigs, so that's 64 gig of RAM on this daughter card. I mean, that's a decent amount for a server, right? I mean, it's maybe not a spectacular amount given today's numbers, but 2011, 2012, 64 gig of RAM was a pretty healthy amount. Now here's the thing. So I've got this daughter card with 64 gig of RAM on it. Never had to try and put this card in one handed again. There we go. But all of these cards are actually populated the same way. So it's not just this riser card. All of these are populated with 64 gig of RAM. So that means this machine has 512 gigabytes of RAM in it which is a lot for today, but a ton for like 2012. Um, you can see here, there's a fan, there's more fans in this unit, but of course with servers, a lot of this stuff is hot swappable. So the fan assembly just comes out, pops back in, no big deal. So what also makes this server kind of special is hidden under here. Flip those latches, pick this guy up and there are four heat sinks under here. What's nice is I like how they've got kind of like the removable handle so you can take them out individually. Um, but this is a quad socket system. Most servers that you see these days are dual socket, meaning two separate CPUs. Of course, most consumer computers are just one socket, but each of these sockets has a separate CPU in it. These are all Xeon E7, 4820 CPUs, I believe. That's an eight core, two gigahertz processor with hyper threading, so 16 threads. Multiply that across, so this server has 32 cores, 64 threads. Now, given like what AMD and Intel are doing, yeah, you can get a, a healthy number of cores out of a single CPU now, but remember 2012, that was a lot of computer power. <laughs> in a single box. So four CPUs, separate heatsink for each. Now, you may be thinking, okay, so this server, you know, it's it's pretty beefy box, a lot of RAM, a lot of CPU. Well, okay, so, you know, what about storage? There, there must be just like a ton of hard drives and stuff in here, right? Well, if we look at the front, a little dark, but you can see we've got these drive bays. There's eight of them. They take two and a half inch SAS drives. But if we pull these trays out, they're all just the dummies. 
This server actually has no hard drives in it, like at all. So how does it boot an operating system? Well, that's hidden back under this cover. If we flip this up again, and you look really carefully down in there, you'll see a couple of USB ports. That thing looks like a USB stick. It pretty much is. In the industry, it's called a DOM or disk on memory. That particular one I think is two gigabytes. And that is the only bit of storage that this server has in it. Um, the idea is you just boot your operating system off of that. Now, Windows obviously isn't gonna fly with that. And most versions of Linux aren't going to fly with that. So what could this server possibly have been used for? Well, if you work in IT, you've probably guessed it already. But if you don't, it's a VMware box. This thing runs VMware ESXi, or at least it ran, because it's decommissioned now. Um, so it had a whole ton of virtual machines running on it. Hence the lots of RAM and lots of CPU power, but no need for disk. All of the virtual machines, like their storage, was actually stored on a separate system called a SAN, or Storage Area Network. It's basically another server that's got a whole bunch of hard drives in it or SSDs and its sole purpose is to serve up those files, I guess you could say, for things like hypervisors to access their files. You can also run file shares and stuff like that off of a SAN as well. But all of this server and the other ones next to it, they don't have any hard drives in them because they would just get all their, their hard drive storage off of the sand. So let's take a look around back and you can see back here we've got quite a bit of networking. Uh, now because this box is from 2012 and we actually use this particular system as kind of like a dev test type of box, um, nothing really critical production ran on it. These are all just gigabit ports but there's still a lot of networking here. So some of these ports would have been used for the network for that, that SAN access. Some of them would have been used for just the regular production network traffic, some for management. You know, you can various kind of slice and dice these how you want to use them. Um, and of course, we had multiple ports in use for each type of network, because obviously you don't want that whole thing to go down if like one network card or cable or whatever were to fail. Uh, so a lot of redundancy on here around back, we've got just kind of your typical other server ports. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of servers, even to these days, still just have VGA ports on there for video. Because, you know, for servers, most of the time, they just run what they call headless with no monitor or anything hooked up. So why do you need really good video on them? USB ports, serial, a couple of onboard Ethernet, and then this management port, which is Ethernet. And that serves up a web page specifically for managing the hardware of the server. Um, it's what they call lights out management. Various vendors have different names for it, but the point is you can use it to log into this web interface and like remotely power the server on and off and see what's on the screen, access the keyboard and mouse and everything just from, when, from within a web browser. So that makes things really, really useful if you are in a different physical location than the server is. So like if this thing were to fail in the middle of the night, I could just remote in like from home and see what's going on with it instead of having to drive into work or whatever. Very useful feature. Another sign as to how beefy this server is, it's not surprising to see servers with redundant power supplies. It's a standard thing, but if you take a look at this thing, this thing is just, it's a monster. You have to like slide this over and lift this big handle up and then it's, you know, pull it out. So at your standard kind of household 100, 127 volts, the power supply will put out 875 watts. Decent amount of power, but if you can feed this power supply between 200 and 240 volts, it'll do two kilowatts. That's some serious juice. Now, because this is a redundant power supply, obviously it means you can lose one of them and the server stays up and running. So an entire power supply can fail, maybe the, the source of power that's feeding this can fail, whatever, the whole server will stay up and running. So this thing at maximum will draw like two kilowatts of power. That's quite a bit of juice and it also outputs quite a bit of heat. Um, so there are various fans throughout the system. The power supplies themselves have fans built in 
And then what cools the RAM and the CPUs, since those don't have fans built in, is that around front here, let's see if I can do this one handed, you can pop these tabs, front panel comes off, and then there are fans underneath here. And of course these are like hot swappable as well, right? Decent sized fan. Um, and so that's what basically pushes air through the front of the system and out the back. Servers are generally front to back kind of airflow. Um, so all the cool air in the server room goes in through the front, gets pushed through all the components, and then the hot air comes out the back to get sucked back into the air conditioner and you know circulated around. There's a view of the PCI cards there, and there's a few slots that we're not using. So here's a look at the other servers on this cart. These were all decommissioned <coughs> around the same time. These four servers were used in a cluster. They also ran VMware. They're more or less identical, but they were purchased in pairs at different times, so the specs are very slightly different. Uh, these are Hewlett Packard HP DL580 Gen 7s. Um, this unit and then the other one sitting down there on the cart were purchased at the same time and they're the older of the two. We can pop the lid on this guy and I'll show you what's a little bit different inside here. They've got very similar specs to the IBM that we just looked at, but the internal arrangement of hardware is actually a bit different. So you can see the fans here are right in the middle of the machine. So instead of having fans up front that push air through, these actually kind of suck the air from the front and then also exhaust it out the back. There's four of them. They're also hot swap, as you'd imagine, um, and really good diagnostics off of all this stuff if any parts fail. You can see in here, we've got kind of this mid-plane type of board. Um, it's what's got the built-in RAID card, again, for SAS drives. Uh, here's the back plane for the power supplies where all the power distribution happens. Um, and then just a couple of auxiliary chips for handling a few of the built-in ports on the back. Just like with the IBM unit over here, these don't have any hard drives in them either. They've also got eight two and a half inch SAS drive bays, but they're all just dummies. What's different though is instead of using a USB DOM like the IBM for booting up uh, VMware ESXi, instead you just got an SD card just slots in here, this is a four gig. Um, what's nice about VMware is when it boots up, it runs directly from RAM. It never really needs to touch its original storage medium again, unless you make a config change that it wants to save. In fact, that SD card could fail while this server is up and running and the server would just be fine. It, it wouldn't care, it would throw a little warning saying, hey, your SD card failed, dude, you might want to fix it. And if you tried to reboot the whole server, obviously it wouldn't be able to boot up, but because VMware runs directly from RAM, it works fine. So you can see we've got a few more PCIe card slots in here. This one's got kind of two back planes going on. What's different about this box compared to the IBM is the selection of networking on the back. So I've got some built-in gigabit ports here. These four port cards are also gigabit, but these dual port cards are 10 gigabit. Um, that speeds things up considerably, especially with storage access for you know, getting the data on and off for running the VMs off of the SAN, basically. Um, again, multiple cards for redundancy, minimum of two links for everything so that if a card fails, a port fails, a cable fails or just gets disconnected or whatever. Everything stays up and running. The last thing you want is to have a whole bunch of virtual machines that are running on this thing just suddenly crash on you. Uh, you can see on the back, same thing, VGA serial, PS2 even. The lights out management port for managing the hardware, getting in remotely, turning it on, installing the OS and all that. Power supply arrangement is a little bit different on this guy um, in that these are each 1200 watts. Um, they're physically quite a bit smaller. They do still have a little fan in the back, but this server requires a minimum of two power supplies just to start to kind of wake up. That lights out management is effectively a computer within the computer. 
Uh, the server doesn't need to be powered on for that lights out management to work. As soon as the server receives sufficient power, that lights out management will start to boot up. So as long as you've got two power cords plugged in the back, lights out management will wake up, boot up, and then you can get in the web interface to actually remotely press the power button on the front. But because of the way this server is configured with the CPUs and the RAM and everything, you need at least three power supplies to supply enough juice for the server to stay up and running, as far as I understand. Um, I've never tried to run one of these with less than three power supplies in it. Um, generally a bad idea when you kind of rely on a system like this all day, every day to work. And that's something that I should mention is these servers weren't just turned on and off on demand when they needed to be used. These, all the servers on this cart were literally turned on and running 24 seven for anywhere between five and seven years straight uh, with very little downtime. The only downtime these HPs saw was probably about a half an hour each a couple of years ago when I upgraded them to those 10 gig cards because obviously I had to power the system off to upgrade those cards. So I kind of went through the stack one by one, um, moved all the virtual machines off onto one of the other nodes, powered it off, swapped the cards, powered it on, did the config changes, and then moved some VMs from the next node onto this one, did the same thing to it. VMware is really, really cool in terms of what you can do when you've got multiple servers like this because you can cluster them together. Each VM, virtual machine, only runs really on one server at a time, but you have the ability to what they call vMotion running virtual machines. They stay up and running the entire time serving data from one node to another on the fly, which is kind of mind-blowing when you think about it. Um, so without any loss of service for the virtual machines, I could basically move them all from say this node to this node or this node to that node, whatever. And it all goes through the network and it just kind of copies the contents of that virtual machines RAM from one node to the other and then just does this handoff or okay, now you've got it. And it just starts doing all the CPU tasks and everything and the virtual machine doesn't know the difference. The other big difference in these servers compared to the IBM is how the CPU and the RAM is arranged. It actually comes out the front here. So you lift up on this tab and then you get this big handle that you can pull down and then it's all in kind of this assembly that slides out. I need two hands to do it, so I'll set that up on top. All right. so. This whole assembly just slots, you know, comes out the front there. You can take this lid off. Oh, I think this handle actually needs to be down. There we go. And then you can see the inside here. So it's kind of the same arrangement as the IBM, that X5, where you've got these separate daughter cards for the RAM. There's eight of them. In this case, it's all eight gig RAM sticks, um, a little bit faster RAM but it's still DDR3 ECC. These are eight gigs, but each of these is fully populated. So there's eight sticks in each one of these instead of four sticks of 16 gig. You got eight sticks of eight. So it's the same amount of RAM. Each of these is 512 gig of RAM. Uh, you've got four CPUs here, separate heat sinks like before. Um, the CPUs between two of these systems are different than the other two. So the IBM was a set of four Xeon E7 4820s, which are, if I remember correctly, the Westmere generation of CPUs. This particular server, and then the other one underneath all the rack rails and stuff, is one gen older. It's the Nehalem series. They are Xeon X7550s. It's the same arrangement where it's eight cores, 16 threads, two gigahertz, but it's just one generation older. So these are 130 watt TDP CPUs. Those E7 4820s are 105 watt TDP, if memory serves. The VMs really don't care what CPU or anything they run on. The hypervisor just kind of takes care of all of that. I mean, you have to stay, you know, x86. You can't, I don't know, x86 based VMs on Spark or something like that. but. In terms of like if the CPU models don't match between some of your servers and you want to vMotion a VM from one server to another, 
VMware just kind of takes care of that for you. But an interesting label on here is this one about weight, because um, this is the quad CPU version. You can order this particular server with fewer CPUs if you wanted, um, but fully loaded, just this assembly weighs 40 pounds. The entire server weighs about 110 with the power supplies and everything in them. Um, these are massive systems. There's a lot of just steel in the chassis and everything. They're, they're built to be physically durable. They're built to house a lot of components and they are not fun to install or remove from equipment racks. Um, unfortunately, I had to decommission all of these by myself. So the way I did it, and 110 pounds is too much for any single person really to manage, especially with a server of this size, when you're also working in a rack full of other equipment that can't get affected. So how I managed to unrack each of these was I pulled this assembly out, which cut some weight, and then I pulled the power supplies out the back, which cut some more weight. That got each chassis down to about 45 to 50 pounds, something like that. And that was manageable for me to slide it out of the rack and then set it on a cart to wheel out of the server room. Um, the IBM was a little bit of a different story because the CPUs are just stuck in there and I didn't really want to pull those heat sinks out, but I pulled the power supplies out and I pulled all those RAM daughter cards out and that reduced the weight of this unit down to, I'm gonna guess 70 pounds, 75 pounds. Um, thankfully, this particular unit was installed at the bottom of the rack at about the same height as the cart that I used to haul it out of the server room. So it was fairly straightforward and manageable for me to just basically slide it out and then pick it up and hop it onto the cart. I didn't really have to hold that weight for very long, but these were a little bit further up in the rack, so taking all the parts out helped quite a bit. So these all got decommissioned basically just because they got old. Um, as with most computers, there is kind of a, a life expectancy to them. While these things were all running just fine when I decommissioned them and took them out of the rack, they were between five and seven years old. Um, it was starting to get expensive to maintain support on these because obviously if a part fails, I want to get a replacement part pretty quickly for it. Uh, if some weird glitch or something happens, um, or access to firmware updates, anything like that. Generally with this enterprise grade kind of stuff, you need to pay for support to maintain access to those resources. So, you know, when servers start to get to that age, the likelihood of parts failing, even though these are built really, really well, with lots of redundancy built in, um, and ability to see like what's going on with the hardware, for example, Here's a little control panel that tucks inside there. This is all just for faults. Anything that may be wrong with the server, anything that may break, this little control panel can tell you, at least from a hardware perspective. So you can see power supply status, fan status, CPU status, and then each of these LEDs in this grid is for all of the RAM modules, a separate LED for every single RAM module. So if anything were to throw a fault or an error, this can kind of tell you exactly where it is. You know, you can check this panel, oh, okay, fan two has failed because the red light's on, you know, that kind of thing. Um, plus that lights out management web interface has the ability to send emails when stuff goes wrong. So you would get an email saying, oh, hey, the fan or the power supply or whatever has died in this server. And then, you know, you can look at that little control panel and confirm exactly which one, which one it is. Um, so with all that said, <laughs> These servers, they came at a cost. Now, I wasn't working here when they were purchased. I started just after they all got bought and kind of put into production. Um, but I'm gonna estimate that each of these was probably around $35,000, uh, each one brand new. And then tack on another, I don't know, maybe 15 to 20,000 per unit over the years to maintain that support. So it, it's really kind of funny, this entire cart with all this stuff when it was brand new is well over $100,000, all this stuff cost. These days though, just because of the age of the system, even though they work fine, even though like literally just a few weeks ago, I took these out of production in favor of some brand new systems, 
Once you get to five to seven years on a server, the likelihood of parts failing starts to go up dramatically. So people don't really wanna buy used servers this old. So each of these, if we were to sell them or even try to buy a replacement one on the used market, maybe a couple thousand bucks. Uh, these still have tons of horsepower to them, even though they have CPUs that are many generations old compared to current. I mean, we're talking to Halem and Westmere, but they still you know, can get viable work done. It's just really interesting to see compared to the consumer market, especially just how dramatic that drop off in price is from new to used in just the span of a few years. So anyway, uh, hopefully you enjoyed this one. It was kind of impromptu. I figured, you know, this is the kind of thing that people don't really get to see that frequently, especially with servers this big. The, uh, the majority of people go with kind of a scale out approach and that's ultimately what I did with the servers that replaced this. Uh, I can't show them to you because they've got names and proprietary information and everything on them. But instead of going with four, four socket systems for the production cluster. The new setup is six servers that each has two sockets in them. Same amount of RAM per server, so half a terabyte of RAM per server. And I should mention that maxed out each of these chassis, I think could hold up to two terabytes of RAM if you got bigger modules. This entire production cluster was two terabytes of RAM plus the 512 for dev test. The new production cluster is three terabytes of RAM because it's six boxes with 512 gig of RAM each. And then instead of eight core CPUs, the new systems have 12 core CPUs. I was never really CPU bound in terms of running all the virtual machines in general. It was RAM and then to some extent, you know, disk access on the SAN. But um, they still sell it. They still sell brand new versions of all of this. Um, the big four socket systems, if you're not using them for virtualization, then you're often using them for like databases, uh, anything where you just gotta crunch a ton of numbers. You're not gonna see it for such commodity stuff like running web servers or whatever. Um, you, you find a much more efficient way to do that, but you can still buy this kind of stuff. Um, it's just the market's definitely heading away from that. Anyway, if you like this video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.